In today's video I'm going to show you how to optimize your economy of motion and get that flying pinky under control. Also, the method you're about to learn is going to improve your sight reading skills without reading a single note. Base hack coming up! Hey Bass Hackers, Misha here with MM Education showing you how to learn faster and practice smarter by using the latest findings in neuroscience so that you can become the bass player you want to be, express yourself freely on the instrument and connect with your audience on a deeper level. So if you're new here, consider subscribing and at any point during the video go check out the show notes in the YouTube description, bullet points for this video, links to related videos and the background music I'm using, as well as free resources, all that kind of stuff in the YouTube description. So let's get going and build some new neural pathways. Let me tell you the story of my journey down the economy of motion rabbit hole. Back in the days when I used to play a lot more metal than I play nowadays, it was all about playing faster, louder and more complex patterns. Playing fast was a really vital part of our music. And at some point I had to reach my upper limit. That's where I started to getting interested into figuring out the ideal way to play, the optimized economy of motion. What does that mean? For example, what you don't want your fingers to do is this. Although the notes might sound quite alright, the further you move your fingers away from the fretboard, the more it will slow you down in the big picture. So what you should be trying to do is to move your fingers as little as possible in between every note. This accounts for both hands, but for today we're just going to talk about the fretting hand and we're going to do this in another tutorial. And one particular problem that I see a lot of my students have is the flying pinky. That's because these two fingers are connected, they are on the same tendon. It's really hard to move them individually. When I took lessons with Anthony Wellington I got really excited about this one exercise he showed me because that was exactly what I needed. Only I didn't know it. So. His exercise is basically about playing all the permutations of the one, two, three, four um, fretting pattern that you can come up with. How many would there be? For the first finger, uh, for the first note, you've got four possibilities because you could start with the first, could start with the second, could start with the third, could start with the fourth. For the second note, you would have. Three, uh, three variations left because one finger you already used for the second uh, third note you would have two and one so it's four times three times two times one equals 24. Here's the permutation cheat sheet as you can see there are 24 patterns each one of these four groups starts with one dedicated finger and then goes through all the variations of it. So there are two ways to approach this exercise. On one hand you could say you dedicate one practice session to each of these 24 patterns, 24 days and you're through. Or you could first establish which ones are the hardest for you to play and then prioritize those in your practice sessions. In general there's two things that you should look out for. Number one, economy of motion. How far do my fingers move away from the string? But also how much pressure do I really need to play a clean note without bass? There's a cool exercise that I learned from Gary Willis where you play a note and then you release the pressure on the fretting hand until it just starts buzzing and then push it down again. Because that's exactly that sweet spot where you use a minimum amount of pressure to stay relaxed but also enough pressure to play a clean note and totally have the bus under control. The other thing that you should watch out for is the left and right hand coordination. To improve your left and right hand coordination 
try to minimize unwanted noises, such as open strings ringing, fret bass noise, and accidentally muted notes that you wanted to let ring out. And last but not least, the evenness of volume of every single note. One thing that I did to get this right out the way without frustrating and boring me, because at the end it is a pretty boring exercise, but it reaps the results you're longing for. A little tip, if you want to quickly um, introduce this exercise into your practicing routine, just start off with it. Use it as a warm-up exercise, maybe 10 minutes max. It's perfect because every finger gets some movement, you get to focus and really go into the zone and then just before it starts getting boring you're already in the flow. You can change to something that's a little bit more exciting to practice. So here's how this exercise works. First you play through all the patterns. Find the one that is the easiest, possibly one, two, three, four, but you never know. So go through them all, find the one that just flows the easiest, most natural, and then establish your top speed. How fast can you play this pattern? Check with the metronome and write it down. Next thing is go through the patterns again. Find the ones that are really critical. Where is it just impossible for you to keep your fingers from flying away from the fretboard? Or which patterns just feel so unnatural that you literally have to take your fingers now, this one now, and then this one, and now this one. Those are your focus patterns for the next couple of sessions. Before you try to get them up to speed to be just as quick and economically effective as the easiest pattern, slow down. Play without a metronome, just concentrate on the perfect movements. Go as slow as it needs to be and have a focus on minimal movement in the fretting hand. Once you can do it up to 10 times in a row without messing up, without your fingers flying off the fretboard, you can start introducing the metronome. As always, start slow and gradually speed up and definitely use the stop fix repeat method, which means the moment you notice something is not right, a little bit of fret buzz, one finger flying off, stop yourself. Send that message to your neural pathways that what you just did is not what you want to be automated. Then repeat that same movement correctly and start over from the top. Now it's just a matter of repeating the flying finger patterns often enough until they, you've got them at the same speed as the easiest pattern. Here's how you can apply this into your routine. Just start out with one to four patterns for every practice session. Play them a couple of times slow without metronome, really focusing on economy of motion. Then determine your upper limit speed, dial in the metronome and play it up and down the neck once or twice. Just a couple of things to look out for when you do this exercise. Number one is um, prioritize visual feedback because we all can play rather quick if we don't really look at our technique we can wing it but this exercise is for automating flawless technique so in the long run you'll be able to play way quicker so for now just be honest to yourself really watch what your fingers are doing there's no use of playing this beat if your pinky is flying away or all your fingers are going so, even if it's half the speed, a quarter of the speed, just be honest with yourself and really take that time for your fingers to get used to moving as little as they need to. Number two, what I see a lot of my students doing is, once they arrive all the way up here, I turn the pattern around and now they go down four three two one four three two one which makes sense if you're thinking in pitches and notes because you play chromatic up and then you play chromatic down right 
But this is all about finger petting. So the finger petting stays the same when you're moving up the, the neck and when you're moving down the neck. So it's still one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I suggest you start on the G string, in my case C string, with going up and down the neck and then if you feel kind of comfortable with that move to the D string, to the A string, to the E string, to the B string, to the F sharp, to the C sharp, whichever you have. Last but not least there's one more option and you can of course come up with your own variations of it. One other way to do this instead of going up and down the neck is just going literally up and down the neck. So. Up. This is actually way easier, especially for the problem patterns where you're not sure which finger is fretting which note. Because this way I can get direct feedback on how what I practice translates to other strings. With different string gorges, it always helps to make sure that what you established on one string works on the other strings as well. In case you're still wondering what all of this has to do with sight reading, it's actually pretty simple. If you know all the patterns that you possibly could play with your four fingers, all the different permutations, then reading music comes way easier because you never stumble upon a pattern that just feels completely unnatural and weird. If you have all your patterns up to the same speed, your sight reading will improve dramatically. Today I showed you how using permutations ensures that your economy of motion is consistent no matter what you play. Remember, the important thing here is to start slow enough to avoid the temptation of winging it. Use, stop, fix, repeat. Further, I showed to you that a focus on clarity and noise reduction will optimize your left-right hand coordination. Now it's up to you to not just take in the information, but instead create new neural pathways in your brain by applying the newly get knowledge. Question of the day. Which is your struggle pattern? Or which are your struggle patterns? Because I remember having quite a few of them. I was actually shocked at how many there were that I could hardly play without a metronome. Not to talk about the top speed of the easiest pattern. Let us know in the comment section. Remember that some of the coolest ideas come from you and the MM Educational community. And if there's a specific topic that you would like to know more about, let me know and I'll cover it in one of the future episodes. Alright bass hackers, thanks for checking out this video. I hope it got you one step further towards becoming the bass player you want to be. Definitely subscribe for more videos just like this and if you enjoyed this episode, you might want to check out my triad hack series in which I show you how to easily remember the most important triad shapes. It's a great way to take your new economy of motion skills and test them in a musical context. Until next time, MM Education is helping you to learn faster and practice smarter. So keep up the good work. Love and bass.